You think you've heard it all in mental health, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, maybe even OCD. But what if I told you those are just the surface? Let me take you deeper into psychiatry's hidden file drawer, the syndromes that sound like sci-fi, but are very, very real. Imagine walking into a cafe and seeing your stalker in every face around you, or waking up pregnant, except you're a man, or believing your body has already rotted because you're convinced you're dead. Five syndromes, all documented, all bizarre, and all showing just how wild the brain gets when things go awry. So as we dive in, keep two questions in mind. What do these syndromes reveal about how the brain constructs reality? And two, if it can create these, how stable is our own sense of normal? I'm Dr. Sunil Rege, consultant, psychiatrist, and educator. Let's jump into the world of bizarre. The first syndrome is known as Frigoli syndrome. Meet Layla, 28 a software engineer. One tram ride and her world fractures. She sees a gray-haired woman glance at her. Her heart races. She's sure it's her ex-landlord in disguise. Next stop, a teenager boards. New face, same fear, same conclusion. Layla isn't paranoid. She has Frigoli syndrome. What is it? Frigoli is a rare delusional misidentification syndrome. You believe different people are actually the same person in disguise. This syndrome was named after Leopoldo Frigoli, a 19th century actor known for lightning fast costume changes. So what's actually happening in the brain? In Frigoli syndrome, there's a breakdown in a part of the brain known as the fusiform gyrus. This is a part of the brain that helps us recognize new and familiar faces. At the same time, the amygdala, our brain's fear center, is on overdrive. And that is a dangerous combination because the brain is perceiving a stranger but feeling a sense of familiarity and threat at the same time. And that mismatch can trigger serious behavioral responses. In fact, over 35% of documented Frigoli cases show physical aggression. And that's why recognizing it early matters. Now, in terms of treatment, we have antipsychotic medication, and certain behavioral strategies. For example, making sure environments are consistent. Even small things matter, like having the same clinician each time. Because a new face, even with the best intentions, can reignite the delusion. Frigoli weaponizes fear. But our next syndrome, it weaponizes empathy until the body starts mimicking pregnancy itself. Our second syndrome, Kuvad syndrome. Marcus is 32, first time dad. By week 30 of his partner's pregnancy, he's put on 12 kilograms. He's craving pickles at 2 a.m. His back aches when hers does. And his blood test, prolactins tripled. Marcus has Kuvat syndrome, also known as sympathetic pregnancy. You see, mild forms affect 20 to 25% of new fathers. Extreme cases involve nausea, contractions, mood swings, and even phantom labor. So what's happening here? There are three major theories. One, hormonal coupling. Men who spend time with newborns or pregnant partners often experience hormonal shifts. Testosterone drops, prolactin and oxytocin go up. Two, mirror neurons. These are specialized neurons in the brain that allow us to simulate the physical and emotional states of others. And Kuvad, that system seems to be in full swing. Three, Emotional processing, things like guilt, anxiety, longing for connection, they may convert into physical symptoms. In some cultures, Kuvad is seen as a good thing. For instance, in parts of Papua New Guinea and in Basque culture in Europe, fathers actively participate in symbolic rituals, like lying in bed after the baby is born, receiving guests while the mother returns to work. Clinically, most Kuvad cases don't need major intervention just reassurance. But if it causes distress or dysfunction, options include cognitive behavioral therapy, sometimes antidepressants such as SSRIs, and believe it or not, pelvic physiotherapy can reduce some of those phantom labor symptoms. So this was an example of empathy rewiring biology. But what if the brain goes one step further? 
and tells you that you're no longer alive. This takes us to a third syndrome, Cotard syndrome. A man walks into a hospital, refuses dialysis, not out of fear, but because he believes his kidneys have already decayed. He says he's dead. He can smell his own rot. Welcome to Cotard syndrome or Cotard's delusion. This is also called the walking corpse syndrome, a full collapse of self-recognition. It unfolds in phases. First, distress about the body. Next, nihilistic delusions like organs missing or putrefying. And in later stages, we might see catatonia, refusal to eat, even suicide attempts. Not to end life, but to complete the death they believe has already occurred. So what's happening in the brain? Functionally, it's a collapse of self-awareness networks. The default mode network, which helps you maintain a sense of self, goes offline. The insula, which monitors internal sensations from the body, also shuts down. Reality detaches from identity. Cortard often appears alongside psychotic depression, strokes, or medical conditions such as autoimmune encephalitis. Treatment-wise, ECT is one of the most effective options. It acts as a neurological reboot. Other options include antidepressants, antipsychotic medications, and of course, careful medical monitoring. Cotard is one of the most frightening conditions I've seen. But what if instead of being dead, your body feels alive, but in all the wrong ways, with bugs crawling under your skin? This takes us to our fourth syndrome, Ekbom syndrome. A 67-year-old woman covers herself in kerosene every night. She's trying to kill the invisible sand fleas crawling under her skin. Third degree burns, no parasites. She has Ekbom syndrome, also called delusional parasitosis. It usually presents with three features, the triad. One, a fixed belief in infestation. Two, crawling sensations under the skin called formication. And three, self-inflicted trauma in the form of scratching, cutting, or chemical exposure. Now, what can cause this? In some cases, we see links with stimulant use such as cocaine or methamphetamine use. In others, it's associated with menopause or vascular issues or even vitamin B12 deficiency. But in primary psychiatric cases, the neurobiology tells us that it's associated with hyperactivity in the somatosensory cortex, the part of the brain that processes touch. The other part of the brain involved is the orbitofrontal cortex, which should override these irrational beliefs, but it fails to do so. But nowadays, there's a new complication. The internet, online groups like Morgellons forums can amplify these shared delusions. What starts as one person's distress becomes a collective rabbit hole. So what helps? First, empathy. If we dismiss their belief, we lose them. Next, low-dose antipsychotics such as risperidone can be extremely effective. Next, focus on sleep and anxiety because hyperarousal makes these sensations worse. So far, we've seen fear, empathy, death, and infestation. But the final syndrome, it breaks the final rule. Body ownership. Syndrome 5, the alien hand syndrome. Imagine trying to eat dinner and your other hand slaps the fork out of your mouth. Or you're buttoning a shirt whilst the other hand unbuttons it. This is alien hand syndrome. A man named John had his corpus callosum severed to treat epilepsy. That's the bundle of fibers that lets the brain's two hemispheres communicate. And after the surgery, his left hand started acting on its own. It would open drawers, throw objects, and even try to choke him during sleep. So what's going on here? There are actually different subtypes of alien hand. One, the colossal type. This leads to conflict between the two hands. Two, the frontal type. This causes grasp reflexes and impulsive grabbing. Three, the posterior type. This makes the limb float or act disconnected from the self. So neurologically what's happening is that the motor commands fire normally, but the supplementary motor area, which gives us the intention to move, isn't engaged. 
So there's a disconnect. So the hand moves without permission. Treatment usually involves giving the hand an object to hold, using visual feedback or even Botox to reduce movement. But alien hand syndrome forces a philosophical question. If we don't always control our own body, what does that say about free will? So let's recap the journey we've taken. First, Frigoli syndrome, where fear hijacks face recognition. Two, we saw Kuvat syndrome, where empathy transforms the body. Three, Cotard's delusion, where self-awareness disappears. Fourth, Eggbaum syndrome, where touch turns against the person. And fifth, the alien hand syndrome, where movement exists without intent. What do they all teach us? That our self is built from fragile networks, perception, identity, emotion, and control. When they misfire, the brain freelances. So here are three takeaways. First, humility. The line between sanity and strangeness is thinner than we think. Two, compassion. These aren't oddities, they're lived realities. And third, integration. Psychiatry needs neuroscience, psychology, anthropology, philosophy, together. If this video rewired your curiosity, hit the subscribe button, ring the bell, and drop a comment. Which syndrome shocked you the most? Want a part two? There are more. Let me know. I'm Dr. Sunil Reggae, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Until then, stay curious, and remember, the brain builds reality, but sometimes it builds the bizarre. Bye-bye.